39, you're watching and listening to Breakfast with Stephen and Anne. Shall we have a look at today's Sunday newspaper front pages? Uh, the Sunday Times leads with a hacking scandal involving some of the country's leading politicians. The Observer uh, talks about the biggest nursing strike in NHS history, likely to take place before Christmas. The Mail on Sunday has a royal exclusive, which claims that Prince Andrew was left in tears when his brother, King Charles now, told him he would never return to royal duties. Sunday Express looks at the Prime Minister's plans <coughs> to have an extra bank holiday for the King's coronation in May. And the Mirror has an exclusive, which is all about Boy George in the jungle. Uh, let's go through those in a bit more detail then with anthropologist Mariana Hotter and political editor of HuffPost UK, Kevin Schofield. Morning to you Morning. both. Marianne. Yes. Um, we've got a massive asylum issue and migration issue and illegal migration issue in this country. We need to process people more quickly. We do. How are we going to do it? Well, we need to do it properly because otherwise uh, the decisions get overturned in court, which is more time consuming and mm. hugely more expensive and unfortunately the home office are recruiting staff to process people's applications to conduct the interviews to work out whether someone's asylum claim uh, can be or is, is legitimate or not they are recruiting people who have no experience which is fair enough as long as you train them but they're not being trained properly they're using things like the lonely planet holiday guides to get a potted history of a country's um, of a country background right. to try and work out whether whether someone's claim might make sense or not, and the interviews aren't making sense. So this is um, a, a report, a, an interview, I guess, by a whistleblower who's very experienced in the asylum system, and they're saying. The people here are, they get recruited, they get the ba very basic training and then sort of thrown in at the deep end to interview people uh, talk, describing very traumatic situations, very complex cases, very, very um, difficult uh, casework to be done because you haven't got all the documents there and, and you're trying to make sense of it all and then apply it to the legal framework that you're, you're using and people can't do it and so they leave again. So then you have to recruit more people. Yeah. So it's not working for us, the taxpayer. It's not working for the people, the poor folk who are doing these jobs and then not being able to do the job so they leave again. And it's definitely not working to address the, the asylum case backlog. Or, indeed, you know, perhaps last on the list, it's not working for the asylum seekers who have to go through all this traumatic no, it stuff. No, it goes somewhere to, to explain why out, things are can't. taking so long to process an application. Yeah, it's exactly. It's being done not as well as it could be done. Oh, terrible, more terrible inquiry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and it, they're yes. life or death decisions. That's the thing it says. They're being asked to make life or death decisions because if you send someone home and it's the wrong person to send home, they may well be tortured or murdered. Mm. Yeah, well, you need the, you see, you need the right people doing the job. Absolutely. Which, whatever your view of it all. Yeah. Um, Kevin, to the Sunday Times, um, Gavin Williamson, who's now Minister Without Portfolio mm -hmm. or some such thing, yeah. uh, is being investigated because he sent some stroppy texts to the Chief Whip. Yeah, um, so this is the former Chief Whip, Wendy Morton. It's hard to keep up. You go through some yeah. ministers yeah. these days. But um, when the Queen died um, and they were deciding which uh, Privy Councillors with senior MPs were attending the funeral, there were over 700 of these Privy Councillors, so obviously they couldn't all go. Um, and Gavin Williamson was put rather put out, to put it mildly, um, that he wasn't on the list. So he kicked off and sent these really abusive, foul-mouthed text messages to Wendy Morton, basically accusing her of bias because he wasn't supportive enough of Liz Truss, you know, swearing at her, um, quite passive, not really passive, actually, quite aggressive text messages. Anyway, she complained to um, uh, the powers that be uh, at the Conservative Party now, this is where it gets quite difficult for Rishi Sunak. So Rishi Sunak was warned about this by Jake Berry, who was the chairman of the Tory party, no longer the chairman, obviously, because he got sacked by Rishi Sunak, um, and was told, look, Gavin Williams has been investigated, or he's just complaint against him, but he still made him a minister. Mm. And now the details of the text messages have, lo and behold, appeared in the Sunday Times, and they, they don't look good. I mean, Gavin Williamson is a guy who... He's quite a divisive figure. If you remember, he was sacked as Defence Secretary for allegedly leaking... Um, from the National Security Council, which is a big no-no. He was sacked as Education Secretary um, for the A-level exams fiasco. Um, a big supporter of Rishi Sunak. So Rishi Sunak obviously rewarded him by giving him a job, but he seems to have overlooked the fact that he was 
already under investigation for these Facing things. a complaints process because of these horrible text messages that he sent to Wendy Morton, the chief whip. So, um, a lot of questions, I think, for Rishi Sunak to answer as to why he basically just turned a blind eye to this complaint and gave him a job. And interestingly as well, Jake Berry, who was sacked by Rishi Sunak and was the chairman at the time, he has given a quote to the Sunday Times basically backing up the story, which, again, I think shows that there's difficulty ahead for Rishi Sunak. Does it matter if someone sends some stroppy, stroppy text messages? Uh, I mean, uh, they're uh, not... Uh, they're stroppy, then. No. Yeah, no, they're better. pretty bad. You don't send that to a colleague. No, uh, um, and it's a man sending to a done. woman, which I don't well, think is great either. Um, and I think if it, was, if it was in a company and it was an HR process, he would he go up sacked. for that. He'd yeah, probably yeah. get sacked, yeah, but yeah. instead he's been given a promotion by becoming a minister. Yeah, um, pretty outrageous. So, uh, you, yeah. Are you it, googling it, them? It no, no, no. <laughs> they, are, they are quite rude. Um, messages, aren't they? And they use are. F words and all the rest of it. Yeah. It's no way to speak to your chief whip, is it? No. It's no way to speak to someone at work. No, no it's no way to speak Absolutely. to anyone. Anyway, and he's a former uh, chief whip himself. And yeah. in the text messages he's saying, oh, don't forget, I know how this works. There was no threatening undertone yeah. um, mm. to the messages. So, the, And the thing that we were talking about is, is it also suggests an arrogance of thinking that you can do that kind of thing, get away with it, it's never going to come out into the public domain. And, and that's arrogance, I guess, from Rishi Sunak's part as well, that, you know, we, there's, a, there's a way of dealing with things like mm. this where it won't get to, you know... Well, remember, when Rishi Sunak to us, the became public. Prime Minister, he stood in the steps of the industry and promised professionalism, integrity, yeah. um, and that these text messages don't suggest that. I, mean, I think it's, if he hadn't given him a job... It wouldn't be a problem for us, just but that's. But once again, problem. you just wonder that these these, <laughs> these um, ministers, uh, they've been ministers and secretaries of state, yeah. still think it's acceptable to just use that sort of I mean, language. Yeah. It's astonishing, isn't it's it? Safe to say he's not it's the most popular MP no, he's not with he's colleagues. Not. Um, he's known for plotting and, you know, working in the dark. Um, so this, yeah, very embarrassing for him, but also, as I say, for number 10. Yeah, very. OK, let's move on, shall we? Mary Ann, this is fascinating. White van mams. White van mam. A third of van drivers are now women. Yep. So... Beep, beep. Oh, wow. Should we, su we be surprised at that? Um, I think because the stereotype is that it's a, it's a lad at the, at the wheel. Hey! You know, like that. Yeah. Um, but, in fact... Uh, so yep. these are people doing delivery type jobs. Could be delivery type oh, yeah. jobs. Manual or... labour. Or... Oh, manual labour. People doing lawn mowing. Uh, there's a, a woman called Paige Waldron, 26, who's been interviewed. She used to be a carer. She now runs a pet sitting service in Derby, and she says um, she's lost count how many times people go. You drive a van? She's like, yep, yeah, that's my van. It's a white yeah. van, and off I go. Absolutely. But that's obviously, fine. we can, you know, all rest at ease when it's 50% of women yes. driving vans. And there's fifty percent of carers are men, and then and then we can all move on to something. Else. But until that happens, we've still got work to do. I just don't really care. The decorator, I, when, when I have to have any rooms decorated in the house, oh, which I need to do actually at the minute, <laughs> because it's so expensive, so now is not the time to do it. But my decorator is Pauline. Good. And Pauline comes she around. Yes, yeah, she's like brilliant. A, actually, number, please. Okay. Yeah, she's very, very good. Oh. Um, but she and she does a smashing job. But you know, so I have a female painter and decorator. That's good. But That's when brilliant. I just didn't think about it, I just thought, oh, she's good. It's a good, decent price. Came and had a look. Off you go. Yeah. No, quite right too. That's it, and that's how it should be, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's pretty good. Um, I was talking to someone who whose friend's a plumber, and she's a woman, and she said that she has this every day give or take, there's a, an, an experience where she feels like she's representing all of women in plumbing mm -hmm. because if she is a bit slower on the, you know, yeah. fixing the tap or whatever it is or kind of plumbing the whatever it is, then it's like, ah, oh, now you see, women shouldn't be plumbers. That's oh, no. It's a man's job, yeah. that is. Yeah. And, um, and so she's, like, every day carrying this burden of womankind and representing... Uh, so I know how she feels. Yeah, yeah. it's tough, isn't it? It yeah. is tough, and I must say, I do I do in the role with lady plumbers who go, my, mine is a lady too, and she comes along. She's prepared to stick her head on, in the under-sink cupboard, you know? Mm, no. <laughs> what wants to do that? <laughs> yeah. But she does it. Brilliant. Well, good on her. I just thought, with all of these things, and without wishing to sound right on, because I'm not really right on, really. You can be. I have 
I have the moments. I have the moments. But I do just sort of think, when it comes to like STEM subjects and, and manual jobs, or thing, if you want to do the job, do it. I don't care what gender you are. Just do it. Yeah. Do but I think well. it's the pressure of society, isn't it? Or the idea that if you're a... Um, a, a, a young woman walking down the street and you see a white van rising up the road, chances are a lot of girls will be like, okay, mm. like, is there going to be a beep beep or a, you know, hey, get your legs out or whatever else. Um, and actually, maybe if it's a, a, a woman at the wheel, that might stop happening as well. Oh, okay. Just less and less, isn't Don't it? Don't mind if anyone wolf whistles at me, I quite like it. <laughs> okay, you must say not anyone like that. Yeah. Only no, you've got to look the other way, male midwives and all that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, yeah. why not? Got work to do. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about fish and chip shops because oh, I'm worried yes. about this. They're struggling to stay afloat. They are. I mean, I'd say fish and chips are probably my favourite. Oh, food. it really is. Uh, of course, you are. Quintessentially. Do you have a battered sausage? Uh, you strike me as a battered <laughs> sausage. <laughs> I did. Just, I don't know what that means. I don't know why you've been like that. Right, <laughs> no, no, you do. You just sort of like the sort of person who'd have a battered sausage. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I've yeah. never had a battered sausage. Actually, no, 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 I've had a battered sausage. I do like it. I, I won't deny it. I do like a battered sausage, but I prefer fish. Yeah, uh, me too. If we're a piece of fast food. to choose. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, um, there are, there are <laughs> just closing left, right, and centre because obviously the nature of the business, they need their ovens to be on all the time. Yeah. They've got yeah. chiller cabinets, etc., and the energy it costs must a lot are of absolutely hammering them. So there's a one here, Jack Backhouse, Betty's Fish and Chips and New Milk, and on the edge of the New Forest. His energy bill has gone from seven hundred and fifty a month to over two thousand pounds a month. Ouch! So and the only way they can make that work is to pass it on to yeah. the customer, yes. but then, you know, the customer's going to say, hang on a minute, I'm not going to pay, you know, an extra two quid for a fish and chip and just don't go and it becomes a vicious circle. Anyway, so they're saying that, yeah, all across the country, um, because of this, um, there's more and more fish, fish and chip shops are closing, so they're asking for um, the, a VAT cut, like we had during the pandemic when it was cut from 20%, I think down to 5%. Um, for fish and chip shops to save them. I mean, given they're looking to save all this money, uh, how that's going to happen. But no, we should no. save our lives. Yeah, Once that's it, because it's don't come all back. those, exactly, it's all those little little businesses. If, mm. if if we can get them through, then then they, you know, generate profit, yeah. they keep the economy and going, point, they've got oh, local people Very, very quickly then, because yeah. we're being, we're being counted out. I was going to say, my grandparents ran a chippy. Good for yeah. them. Yeah. Queen, Street, we, Queen Street Chippy in Dalton. You ever went there? We back all remember back our day? local chippy, don't we? Yeah, yeah. 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 love our local chippy. It's the beating heart of our village, I can yeah. tell you, and it's been out of business for a while. I, I think that's the thing about sort of things like a VAT cut. It goes back to what we were saying. Tax, you know, often the conversation is, um, oh, tax is bad, it's, it's the government stealing our money. But actually, if you can use it carefully and sensibly, then it actually creates the society we want, which is something like having a corner shop and a chip shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very quickly, while we're talking about food, yeah. we've got a moment to yes, just have, quickly yeah. tell us good about what Mary, Queen of Scots, ate while she was waiting for the chop. <laughs> well, before she was waiting for the chop, she was imprisoned for many, many years by her cousin, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth the First. And because she was a queen, uh, she got to live in a palace or castle, but she was very much imprisoned. But um, the British uh, Library have just got hold of documents showing the accounts for the households. And she lived, you know, she lived, or she ate well, at least. I mean, she didn't have a freedom, and then she did get her chopped off, which is not great. No. Um, veal, or salmon, Really? Scottish salmon? Uh, let's guess. Saffron, ginger, nutmeg, that olives, almonds. That time, that time. Yeah, was, this is like 1568. Yeah, so she's like eating all the superfoods. Well, she was a queen. And fruits preserved in syrup and marmalade. Oh, very oh, nice. That's lovely. We've got just under 60 seconds left from Queen Elizabeth the I and what she did to uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. So Queen Elizabeth II having tea with Tom Cruise. Who knew? It turns out in the summer, um, the Queen uh, struck up an unlikely friendship with Tom Cruise. Now, um, he was involved, if you remember, in the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. Mm -hmm. And because the Queen's mobility wasn't great, she didn't actually get to meet him at the, um, actually at the event. So she made it known that she was very disappointed. So he got to fly and land his helicopter uh, and met her. Um, and they'd arranged to meet up in the future, also that's not sadly going to happen anymore. But um, but there but there we go. But it's worth it for the headline alone. Yeah. My wing mom.
Oh, absolutely. You see what they did? Very, very oh, good. Oh, she knew what she was doing, didn't she? Uh, Mary Ann, Kevin, good to see you both this morning. Thank you yeah. very much indeed. And we've got all the top stories heading away in just a moment after the weather.